Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at eSilicon today with Bill Isaacson, who's going to talk today about some real-world experience with 2.5D, which you've probably been hearing a lot about in the marketplace. So, Bill, you've been working with this for a while now, right? How long have you actually been developing 2.5D chips? Uh, eSilicon started work on 2.5D in 2011. We've been at it for four years now. Uh, in that time, we've developed test chips trying out multiple technologies, looking at the reliability of that technology, developing our IP to enable our solutions, and now working on showing for real production designs how they are manufacturable and reliable. And so how many chips have you actually taped out at this point? At this point, we are up to four tape outs on test chips, and we are up to one early production design with many more on the way. So 2016 will be the year of 2.5D? Absolutely. We're seeing the customer demand for 2.5D really exploded this year. We went from talking to customers about what the capabilities of the technology to receiving RFQs from the customer on what they really wanted to be doing to now having informally engaged with customers with multiple designs in progress on multiple technology nodes all around 2.5D technology. So can you show us what a 2.5D chip actually looks like these days? The first ones we saw were, were rather crude. Yeah, absolutely. So I have an example with me. What are we looking at here? Yes, this is a organic interposer vehicle that we're looking at right now. In the middle, we have a large FPGA. Out on the edge, we have four HBM1 stacks. This is sitting on top of a large organic interposer. This thing is 38 by 30 millimeters, so very large in size. Uh, underneath the, the die, we're looking at 57,000 microbumps on this organic interposer. So very, very large counts and almost 5,000 C4 bumps on the bottom of it. So a large complex vehicle. This is something which was intended to mimic what our customer designs are expected to look like. So we did this several years ago in anticipation of where the customers would go. And what we were able to do is evaluate the materials, evaluate the assembly processes, evaluate the performance that we were achieving with this technology, get a very early look at it before we had customers in place demanding it. We, we've been hearing about the organic interposers for a while. Was there a problem in using those? Well, there's a lot of promise in the technology. The promises of the technology are very large interposer sizes, something that we struggle with on the other alternatives today. Uh, very low loss material, which means we can run at very, very high speeds, which is very promising to us. Uh, that allowed us to evaluate the benefits of the technology. Uh, along the way, we were also able to get experience with the assembly of the, pro of the technology. That's definitely a challenge today. It's still early technology, but the promised outcome of what we could get from it, from a speed and from a size standpoint, are still very interesting to us. So how does the organic interposer compare with your test in silicon interposers? Yes. So what we see today is silicon interposer is really the dominant interposer technology. There are multiple sources of the interposer. There are multiple sources of assembly processes around silicon interposer. And it's really what is here today for us to be building chips around. We will continue to look at and evaluate alternative materials. And as those materials mature in the supply chain, we will begin to incorporate them into our actual designs. When you talk to your customers who are actually uh, pushing for a 2.5D chip, what are you finding is driving them? What, is it just the end of Moore's Law? Is it the fact that it's, it's too hard to get to the next node? What, what are the problems? Yeah, the number one problem that customers are dealing with right now is how to get memory bandwidth from their ASIC out to the memory. Uh, that has really been the driver for 2.5D technology for us. It's been the usage of HBM memory, which cannot be incorporated into a chip any other way other than a 2.5D solution. Um, how about reliability? What are you finding in terms of the new technology? Because it is a new technology, right? Yeah, absolutely. So from a reliability standpoint, there's a lot of ways of answering your question. So part of what we're looking for is in the supply chain, do we have good sources of interposer? Things like are the TSBs solid? Are the microbumps solid? There's a lot of data available right now. Then we also look for assembled overall devices um, is there information showing us that they're robust, reliable over their lifetime? And indeed there is. Now a lot of that reliability evaluation has to be reevaluated on every customer design that we're doing unless we have very strongly representative data. And what we find today is this is still 
relatively low number of designs using the technology in the overall industry. And it's very easy to find representative data, but it may not be precisely the combination of what we're trying to build. The combination of the wafer technology, the interposer technology, the sizes of those, the number of chips that we're trying to place on top of the interposer, that intersection, meshing that with what the customer is trying to do is still a challenge today. One of the big concerns with 2.5D that was cited initially was cost. Mm -hmm. Is the cost under control at this point? So cost is still going to be a challenge, absolutely, right? What we're doing is we're taking and adding an additional thing into the overall solution, that thing being the interposer. So if we add a step, we're going to add cost. That's true. But right now with the applications that we're dealing with, if you look at the other ways of accomplishing what the customer wants to get, which is memory bandwidth, the alternatives are, are much more difficult for them to deal with. They're either dealing with uh, complex boards and multiple packaged parts, or maybe a much larger ASIC because they have to put so many memory interfaces, which generates other problems. So really what we're seeing is this is the best solution. It's recognized by customers as the best solution for solving their memory bandwidth problem. When we're talking about building an ASIC, first of all, we've got customer requirements. Then we are going to map that to the ASIC technology. Then we've got the IP that goes into that design. And finally, we have the available solutions, which are known inside of the industry that we can rely upon for the qualification data that we need. And the problem that we're running into is this is the intersection. There is no intersection. We run into this all the time. And what this is generating is in addition to doing our customer ASIC design, in parallel very often we're doing test chip development to fill this hole in the middle. So what is your strategy for making sure that these devices will work? So we have a combination of standards compliant test that's built into our IP to test these interfaces. But then we also have programmable test features that sit behind our IP that allow us to have these very flexible solutions that we're talking about. Do the existing EDA tools that are out there, do they work on this kind of device? Yeah, the existing EDA tools that are out there do work on these devices. So we're using the same tool set that we're using on our other ASICs to accomplish 2.5D based design. Your goal out of this is more than just a high-end networking chip or uh, for a high-end ASIC though, it's probably to be able to swap things in and out as we move into the IoT world, right? This is just the beginning. So this is just the beginning and the prevalent usage that for the technology really has been high bandwidth memory. What we've seen is once there was a real technical requirement that demanded the technology, suddenly the demand for it came on very quickly. And I think as this technology now progresses down into higher volume, it'll be similar drivers. There'll be a technical requirement that really demands the technology that will drive the adoption. One of the advantages of a 2.5D architecture is that you can mix and match different process technologies within the same chip. How much of that is actually showing up and, and are we actually seeing any problems develop from that? Well, we're already there today. We're today combining DRAM technology with CMOS technology in our HBM-based solutions. So that's happened already. Now, it's taking the same idea and expanding it out further, combining multiple different technologies for multiple different functions, is definitely an area which is, uh, holds a lot of promise. And then it goes back to finding the right combination of the solution that we're trying to uh, solve for the customer as well as the available information and trying to figure out if we need to augment what's out there with test vehicles. Any concerns in terms of the packaging? Has that entered into this in terms of problems that you didn't expect? No, the package technology that we're talking about is still the same build-up flip chip technology that we're using on all of our other uh, high complexity ASICs. That, that has actually remained very similar. And physical effects like thermal and um, electromigration, are they less of a problem in this kind of design or more? Well, the challenge that we face thermally is that there's very tight thermal coupling between the die which are on the interposer. And that means that they're self-heating each other. It also means that we're dealing with, if there's a chip with some temperature limitation associated with it, it becomes the limit for the overall chip, even if other designs or other chips in there 
can tolerate a higher junction temperature. So that is an impact that we're dealing with, but that really comes down to a thermal escape solution. And it's something that we work with our customers to define and solve. So when do you see this technology starting to roll out uh, on mass? And what are you starting to see in terms of momentum for it? Sure. 2015 is really the year of the interposer from our perspective. We've seen the customer interest, the customer design wins have really exploded this year. If we look at our information for the overall industry, we see well over 30 tape outs of the technology industry-wide in the coming year. So that's really accelerated very quickly. And what's very exciting about it is, yes, HBM has been one of the initial drivers, but now that the technology is being driven, the use scenarios for Interposer are just exploding. And so what we see is we're going to, we're really at the beginning of these ramp right now. We're going to see more use of the technology. We're going to see more use case of the technology, more good ideas on how to take advantage of this technology. Bill Iverson, thanks for some great insights into a really interesting area. Thank you.